Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Welcome to the Apex Hour. This is KSUU Thunder 91.1. My name is Lynn Vartan, and we are talking about music this week. We've just been having such a wonderful time. Um, my guest in the studio is Marissa Michelson. Welcome, Marissa. Hi, thank you. So happy to be here. Yay! We've Yay. been having so much fun. I have so much to tell all of our listeners about you and your work, and we're going to be playing examples of your work. Um, Marissa is a composer. Are, um, based right now in New York. That's right. And um, I have some of your lists of accomplishments. Um, and so bear with me while I celebrate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that's really interesting about Marissa's work, which we'll get into, is that um, it's really uh, interdisciplinary, music theater, choral. Um, we're going to talk about composition, music composition coming in and out of your body. Mm. Um, she has several awards. Um, the group that she works with now, which also I can't wait to talk more about, is the Constellation Corps, um, an ensemble for which she is the founder and director and collaborator mm-hmm. in. And some of her awards uh, include uh, her Song of Song of Songs uh, music theater piece won a 2017 Creative Engagement Award from the Lower Manhattan Culture Council. Um, she also is a grant recipient, uh, 2018 National Endowment for the Arts, 2017 Creative Engagement Award, a Jonathan Larson Award, American Music Voices, the Next Generation Award, uh, and then a grant to study Indian Hindustani singing in India. She's been in residence at the McDowell Colony, very elite, um, incredible, I'm sure, experience, which we can ask her about. Blue Mountain Center, Theater Works Palo Alto, Montclair University, Millican University and wow you've just been all over uh, sharing your voice as a composer so thanks for spending the time today oh it's so great to be here I've been having an amazing time it's been very exciting yeah the the reason that you're here is a work that you had written and called Nama's Ark yes. and um, I'd love for you to uh, begin sort of by telling uh, everybody about this work um, the reason that you're here doing this work is that you are working with all of our singers and some dancers and we are going to be going up to Salt Lake Southern Utah University is going to be going up to Salt Lake in January January 4th to perform your work at the Cathedral of the Madeline and then we're going to be back down in Cedar City January 12th so Tell me, what is Nama's Ark Great. about? Great. Yeah, so Nama's Ark is in, called a community oratorio, and it was written, um, composed by me and written uh, by myself and the librettist Royce Vavrak. Mm-hmm. And this is about an hour-long oratorio that was originally commissioned by Master Voices in New York City for five choirs, hundred, uh, hundreds of singers, and had a performance this past June in Rockefeller Park starring Tony Award winner Victoria Clark and many other incredible, incredible singers. And it's an oratorio that is meant to involve professional singers and professional musicians as well as community members who may or may not have the opportunity to sing before. Um, there's a gospel choir, there's a Hispanic choir, There's a Jewish choir, the shul choir. There's a drum circle. Mm -hmm. um, And there's a high school choir and a children's choir in addition to this kind of main choir. And Southern University is taking on many of these roles and the soloists and um, being the main choir. And then 
Well, then you all are collaborating with additional community groups in Salt Lake, in and around Salt Lake. Oh, there's also a call to prayer. So this is an oratorio that tells the story of Noah's Ark from his wife's perspective after they land. Her name is Nama in our piece, and it's her job to make sure that all of the animals can settle in the new land. And she wonders whether they are going to be able to get along. And this is a container for exploring many different cultures musically and making space for different religious traditions to coexist in the same piece. Yeah. Yeah. And community oratorio, I mean, that's not something you hear every day. Yeah, I don't think it's really a thing, but it felt right for this piece. Yeah. Um, and in it, an oratorio has a very classical connotation, mm -hmm. classical music, and there's plenty of classical inspired music in this, but there's also a major folk element and there's, like I said before, music that's meant to be able to be sung by people of different levels. Yeah. And ultimately, the, the whole thing comes to life only when a community is involved. So in my vision for this piece, it's an oratorio for the people and yeah. that can be done in various places and by lots of different communities to make music together. Yeah. yeah. And sort of the vision, it, it goes beyond the music in that way. I mean, it's really yeah. about bringing the people together. And yes. and I know you and I have had a chance to talk a lot this week about your personal feelings about that and the importance of that sense of community and, and that for you, maybe music is the vehicle to do it. But what you really want is people connecting, especially now, right? That's right. And especially for this piece, mm -hmm. this is a vehicle for communally making music, communally inviting multiple perspectives voices to have an opportunity to sing and to sing together. So it's not so common, at least in the world I'm in, that there's a gospel choir singing next to a shul choir. Yeah. And that at the same time, all of the different musical groups are also being part of a piece that is artistically seeking and artistically virtuosic as well. So my my desire was to combine these elements of folk and community with a piece that is full of musical experimentation and inquiry. Mm -hmm. And that felt like a great way to also um, to also bring communities into conversation with each other through exploring music they probably haven't really explored before. There's yeah. a lot of elements in this that are not usual in yeah. this piece. And one of the things that's that that you sort of just alluded to is that um, you know, as a as a modern living composer, we we tend to the the music that's written in the new music world tends to be very complex, very virtuosic, mm. but maybe doesn't have that community or that um that that sort of deep spiritual uh place mm. in in the same way mm. and then the the community music or you know maybe doesn't have the so you're really kind of trying to bridge those worlds yeah i do sometimes think of myself as a bridge yeah. um or not that I have accomplished being a bridge, but that that's a space I am attempting to create and occupy. And that's a bridge between musical styles, a bridge between classical and folk, yeah. a bridge between um, virtuosic and um, physical. Yeah. And it's true that for me at the center of all my work, there has always been, um, probably always will be, but you never know, a uh, a kind of spiritual longing at yeah. the center of it. And this piece is um, a biblical story, of course, and it does reach for transcendence in the music. And so in a way, it's kind of a ritual of creating spiritual experience that ends up being sung by by all of these different cultural, religious groups mm -hmm coming together in one moment to create a new spiritual experience. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And so so now, you know, I wanted to kind of start by talking about the work and the reason you're here, but mm -hmm. now let's backtrack. So that's a very fully realized um, uh, 
place I feel that you're you're really in touch with and mm. really connected with H- tell us a little bit about how you came you know how did you get from there to here yeah. you know in your own story how did you evolve to this point um where this is what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it where kind of spiritual inquiries at the center or yeah, yeah. and and cuz i know that you st- you started composing very young mm-hmm, right and mm-hmm. and so i know you've we, you've had this conversation with me but for our listeners kind of how you that that sort of origin story if you yeah. will yeah <laughs> yeah i started playing classical piano when i was 4 years old and i i loved piano right away i loved it i loved practicing I was interested in making up my own songs. And at the same time, I was also performing and singing in musical theater as a young person. And as I, as I grew up, I became more and more interested <laughs> as you become a teenager in angsty music. And I was writing, I was writing music that was potentially, I mean, inspired by Tori Amos, who was my hero, still is. And, I was also performing and acting and actually, and I don't think I've actually mentioned this yet, but I went to NYU's graduate musical theater writing summer program as a 15 year old. And that's when I kind of got the idea in my mind that one could write a musical. Um, I had been writing either classical music or my own, my own kind of version of angsty folk. Mm -hmm. Um, and I enjoyed that because as an actor, I was interested in embodying different people's perspectives. And so that became something I was exploring. And I wrote a musical about McCarthyism that was ended up becoming my independent senior project in high school. So my school, I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts, was super supportive of that. And then we performed that musical and... That was a big experience um, <laughs> for me. I remember just, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a lot to hear all of your music performed by so many people out loud. And it was also totally filled with anxiety. I wanted it to be so perfect and it was not perfect. And I would run out of the room and I would just cry in the bathroom. Oh, no. Um, but that helped me start to learn from a young age that I ha- how to engage with the process in a way that wasn't going to be so painful. Yeah. I've had to learn that lesson again and again and again yeah. and again in every project I work on. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. And I, I kept going and writing and it's... Uh, my journey has taken me more and more from the world in which I was born, which seems like the musical theater world, and more and more into experimental abstract spaces and more and more into my body. Mm. Um, And inherent to me has always been a deep kind of emotionalism um, and a deep seeking, uh, seeking for, for spirit and one thing I remember when this piece I wrote, this this experimental musical called Tamar of the River, which was produced by Prospect Theater in New York City and starring Margot Seibert. Um, I remember when, when in a workshop of that happened in D.C., so, uh, one of my parents' friends saw it, and I think she said something to my mother like, Marissa has so much deep spiritual yearning in her, doesn't she? And my mom told me that. And I remember in some ways... That was that made that verbalized an experience I hadn't been verbalizing. It was just natural to me that there's something, you know, I am seeking yeah. that is of the spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you you went to India. That's also I did. A yeah, I went to India and I studied Hindustani singing there when I was around 21 or 22, I think. And that was hugely informative, and I I loved it. I wish I could remember and just pop out right now for you, Araga, me singing Araga. I gotta get get on that because oh, I would. Love I know, that. I know, I can. I don't. It's like I don't have a good long term memory, maybe. But um, that was that was a transformative experience and um, fascinating to get to know music in a different way. And you said that when you were there, mm-hmm. you you sort of went to. Uh, study music a little more generally mm-hmm. and then and then just kind of found a teacher. Yeah. I was super disciplined 
um, human my whole life and kid. And I went with somehow I went and to this residency in India with this idea I was going to be writing music mm -hmm. every day. I even dragged my my Alesis keyboard with me all no the way, way to India like a crazy person. <laughs> Never will do that again. Um, and once there, I just had a super strong experience of I'm in India. I gotta go. I gotta get out. Yeah. <laughs> I can't write anything. I can't write anything. I can't. I can't absorb and create. Like I can only absorb right now. Uh -huh. And so I felt like, how can I stay with with this grant and still do music? And it was so obvious. I have to do this music. I have to learn this music. And so yeah, I found a teacher through I don't even remember um, somebody I had met, and he was amazing. And yeah. he didn't speak any. He didn't English. speak any English. So how did the and lessons he just work? demoed to me? He would bring his harmonium and he would just sing, and he he could say a few words and he would indicate. Now you do it. <laughs> so he would yeah, and that's kind of how it just went. That's amazing. Yeah. So I didn't learn any theory of Indian music. It wasn't right. like that at all. It was just a very experiential process of let me sing this music with you. Well, speaking of your singing, yeah. we have some musical examples, and I think we'll start with them. This is an excerpt from the third movement of Song of Song of Songs. And do you want to tell us a little bit about what this movement is about and what's going yes. on? Yes. So this is a piece that's part of my Desire Divinity Project, which is ultimately going to be three parts. Um, Part one right now is Sappho fragments, taking the poetry of Sappho and setting it to voice and movement. Um, and part two is Song of Song of Songs. So I have used a translation that I love and I've been using that text and also writing some of my own and also devising a little bit of text with my ensemble Constellation Corps. The, that group is the ensemble this piece was written to be performed with. And in this third movement, um, the piece ab in an abstract way goes on a journey from the, um, from the kind of more traditional to the unconventional from the, uh, from, from the classical in a way to the contemporary and from heteronormative to queer. That's the idea behind it. And in this movement, the text that you'll hear is from the Song of Songs saying, bind me, now I know you. If I'm a wall and my breasts are towers, for my lover I'm a city of peace. And that text is taken up by various members of the group and sung in different ways and there's lots of movement happening and there's some improvisation as well. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, let's have a listen uh, right. against the, the third movement excerpt from Song of Song of Songs.
Okay, well, welcome back. So that that you just heard um, was song, uh, the third movement excerpt from Song of Song of Songs. And the composer is Marissa Michelson, who is joining us in the studio today. And this is the Apex Hour. You're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. Welcome back, Marissa. Thank you. It was fun that to hear that. That is such a powerful, I mean, it's so beautiful. Thank you. It's a pleasure to perform. It's a real <sighs> moment for all of us in, in the group to come together. I'd just like to say, in addition to me singing solo there, you heard um, Heath Saunders mm -hmm. and Patrick Cragen, and Aubrey Johnson was the woman doing the kind of crazy <laughs> yeah. at the end there. She's a friend of mine and a fantastic singer. It sounds York. like she, you were saying that her range is just yeah. spectacular. <laughs> She's like, yeah, off the charts. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Aubrey. I'm going to have to send Yay. her this now. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I've been really fascinated to learn about and um, like so excited about is this your group, the Constellation Core. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that group came to be. So it came to be um, in a kind of many small miracles, and the first the first initiation of it came from my time at McDowell, actually. So I went to McDowell after Tamar of the River, which I think you're going to hear a little bit of later, mm -hmm. happened off Broadway in New York City. And then I had gotten another commission to write a piece called The Other Room with librettist Mark Campbell. And so I did that piece. And that felt like a a real busy um, time for me and one piece right after the other. And I was, I needed a way to get out of the city and kind of reflect on everything that had happened. It felt like a real turning point in my life as an artist. Hmm. It felt very obviously to me at the time, and it still feels that way today, that coming to the end of Tomorrow of the River was like the end of an era wow. for me. Like it was like the end of part one of did my you, life. Did you recognize that at the moment? It or felt so. It I, felt so. That's so interesting because usually upon reflection, we yeah. can see those. No, you know? I remember even telling my dad at one point, like, I've written my magnum opus. And he was like, no, definitely don't say that. You're like <laughs> five years old. <laughs> um, but it felt to me like that piece was the culminate Tomorrow of the River. It was the culmination of everything I'd ever been born to do and wow. to write. And I was completely satisfied with it musically, honestly, like, I felt it accomplished what I had set out to do, and it was a, a great expression of everything I was looking for as a musician and artist to that point. And then I knew I was going to go off into another direction, but not one that was divorced entirely from, from that same path I'd been on, the same lineage, but one that was just starting something new. So sometimes I, I feel like I was at a, a very high level at the at, at where I was and I was then going to start writing pieces that might be at a low a, a lower level you could say in the new the new path that mm. I was going on mm. so it felt like that to me at the time and then I I needed to get out of the city and reflect and write and I thankfully thankfully got into McDowell and then to Ucross so I had kind of which is in Wyoming I had a total of basically t um two two and a half months or three months out of the city mm -hmm. and that was a deep soul searching time for me to go inward and think what is next and what do I want and do I want to write um, another piece like Tamar or do I want to even write anymore yeah. <laughs> what do I want um, and I never felt like an, a clear answer came to me while I was on these residencies but for some reason, it came to me after, after it never came to me like a light, a flash of light. It was just I got back to the city after this long this time and suddenly other things were clear and happening. And for people who might not know, um, you know, a composer residency like McDowell or mm, like you cross. Yeah. I mean, you, we know what those are. But right. I think for the general population that I mean, you're you're really alone for a chunk of time often. Right. Well, I love being alone, I will say. But I um, yes. So a residency is a place where you apply to go. Um, generally, I mean, you can have your own residency as well. But and then you are given a studio with a piano or if you're a visual artist with materials or room to paint. Um, 
And you're taken care of. You're given three meals a day. At McDowell, they leave your lunch for you outside of your room in a yes. basket every day. Uh, yes, that's what I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And I have to say, you know, being an artist is not generally being super supported in a luxurious way. Right. And I really, it was so transformative to feel like people are here setting up an experience for me to just be as creative and full as I can be. Like that's, that's what they are, want. They're mm -hmm. trying to make it, make my life as easy as possible so that I can go deep and create art. And there's something about that kind of support that feels just magical and is so, so supportive and so not normal. And you didn't, the isolation, because I know other composers, I've known other composers who've done McDowell in particular, mm. but uh, you didn't feel isolated. I mean, were you no, lonely at no. all? But you also can, you see everyone at night for dinner. Mm. Um, the, everyone eats dinner in the same place and breakfast. But no, I will say I've, I've always been a person who has a high tolerance for solitude. Oh. I've just always loved it. And I also love being around people. And I'm yeah. super extroverted and introverted. Yeah. Um, but I, in order to get to make my art, that is to me comes from solitude. Yeah. So I'm never bored and I'm, I never have nothing to do. Um, and I never feel like I have enough time. Like mm -hmm. I've never felt like this is too much because I always feel like I can go deeper. Yeah. So for me, no, that wasn't a thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I totally went off on a tangent, yeah, but I'm but, so curious about those residencies. No, it is an interesting you know. thing. Um, but, but then you got back. And well, yeah. So at McDowell, I, it started to come to me that I, I, some kind of germination of this idea about an ensemble. It wasn't like, I want to have an ensemble. It was like, how can I create work in collaboration with other humans and um, how can I experiment mm -hmm. in the ways that I want to experiment with people who I trust and respect. And so when I got back, um, a couple of things magically came into place. I reached out to some of my trusted collaborators, um, a few who come to mind. Chad Goodridge is someone who's been part of the ensemble from the beginning and someone I'd already worked with for eight years or so. Um, and Tamron Goldberg, who was in Tamar. And um, I reached out to my friend Sean Schaffner, just people who I'd had these working relationships with and asked at first if they would be willing to just come to my room um, once a week and just oh, play with some stuff. That's great. And they all said yes. And... Um, uh, Troy Anthony actually at the time was one of the people. And so that was, that was great. That was just like, Hey, let's come, let's have a drink and play. But then the, the, at the same time, for some reason, I had been interested in the space at Judson Memorial Church in New York City. It's right on Washington Square Park. It's a historic space that has been, um, Oh, it's a working active church, extremely progressive, um, extremely committed. And at the same time, it's also been a supporter of experimental arts since the 60s. Um, so I kind of, I don't even remember. It was a, another small miracle. I reached out to um, Micah, who's one of the ministers there. And he is also an artist. And I, I think... Um, there was an opportunity somehow to to be involved in his magic time program, which is gives some resources of support to create a piece to perform on a Wednesday night. Magic so I, time. Yeah, it's called magic That's time. Awesome. It's another <laughs> little magical moment. So that was when I was able to manifest Song of Song of Songs. Um, and then out of that, I talked to Micah about, could we come here every week? My group of collaborators and I, and he said yes. And that's so extraordinary because in New York City, that's just um, very difficult to come by. Right. And not only did he say yes, but most people in the group wanted to commit to this and come starting at 8 a.m. on a Friday, which for performers is not really prime time. Everyone's yeah. exhausted. Yeah. And it just it just kind of happened like, let's just play together. Let's just let's just play. Let's just how does this feel? What do we want? What do we like? What if we try this? Do you all like doing that if I give you this material? Okay, no, what if we try this? And then it coalesced into a more formal entity um, where I feel like the 
the process was has been very organic, unlike other areas of my life where I have fought very, I feel internally like I've fought super hard. Mm. A lot of what happened here came super organically. And then flash forward in time and we ended up performing um, in the premiere at the New York Philharmonic of Ashley Fury's piece with the new conductor, Yap Van Sleden, in just a month ago. Congrats. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just one of those things that has and happened. And these collaborators now, I mean, you have the original collaborators, which I'm sure some of them are still with you, and you've added more people. Mm -hmm. And how do you choose these people? What is special yeah. about these individuals? Yes. What are you looking for in your band? Yeah. First and foremost, I'm looking for um, energetic aliveness uh, I and love that. a kind of vibrant um, spirit and pr sense of presence. Also, um, playfulness, curiosity, and the... Uh, and the desire to try things and go deep. Mm. First and foremost, that. And then also that there's a, a discipline in which a person is very passionate, yeah. whether it's composing or dancing or singing or, I don't know, uh, acting. And there has to be a level of virtuosity in a field, but the first and foremost kind of consistent um, thing that that I'm drawn to for people is a, a sense of their authentic aliveness as I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. But we have two um, sort of short examples on uh, Humina. Is oh, that, yeah. 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 And, uh, and that's just a quick minute. Yeah. And this is one of your, is it come out of one of your Friday morning sessions? So every Friday now, we actually make a one minute video for Instagram. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And yeah, it's actually become fun. It's become a, a real joyful, interesting, fun, artistic part of the process. And what we do is Chad Goodrich, who I mentioned before, he comes up with the visual idea and films us. And we have, and I take one of the, we, we always record ourselves improvising each mm -hmm, week. Mm -hmm. And I take a one minute clip of our improvisation and either just use it as, as is or um, add some effects to it. Mm -hmm. And so what you'll hear is improvisation. And I wish you could see them, but you can go to Instagram. And and these are on Instagram, but they're also on they're the also Constellation on the website. Core website. Yes, and so that has longer videos on it as well and more of our lengthy works. Yeah, yeah, and Constellation Core is Constellation, as you would expect it to be spelled, and then C-H-O-R.com, ConstellationCore.com. Yes. Well, let's listen to one of them. This is Humina. This is one of um, the Constellation Core's uh, Friday performances. It's just a quick little excerpt and yeah. we'll have a listen and here you go. Okay, so that was Humina and the Constellation Core, uh, improvised and di directed by Marissa Michelson. And uh, if you really want to check it, I mean, there are beautiful images. These yeah, are, Chad does an amazing job. Yeah, they're all the, mm -hmm. the faces of the performers with yeah. different hand motions and yeah. things like that. So again, that's constellationcore.com. One of the things with the Constellation Core is I'd love to know, what are your future plans? Mm. Or as much as you can tell us, what are you sure. working on right now? You've got the Friday meetings and yeah. everything. Yeah, so um, the, the ethos of Constellation Core is about a, ki a kind of performance practice 
And I want to be clarifying those principles in writing and for all of the members of the ensemble so that we can all own them um, more and more clearly and be able to teach those principles or um, as or make it easier to invite in new members. And because Constellation Core has been such an unfolding experiment, one of my primary um, intentions with it is to just make sure in every moment that any project we're part of is super in alignment and that there's like a 50-50 relationship between my action and the universe meeting us back. So one of the things that seems to be happening is that there this this group wants to collaborate with mm-hmm. other musicians and that and other groups mm-hmm. and that seems to be coming. So there's a couple things I can't talk about but that are in the yeah. in the future as far as how was our ethos and our group going to meet this other group's ethos That's and awesome. whether I'll be composing for that or whether someone else will. Yeah. All of that is up in the air. Um, and we in Constellation Core as a group is a group that improvises consistently as a practice, as a communal practice, as a as a point of view, as an ethos, as a com- commitment to being in the world as an improviser. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a practice for us and hopefully could become a practice for many people. And... I believe that having that consistent practice makes composed work that we do so much deeper and stronger that to have a kind of company and of humans who meet regularly br- helps to bring a deep life to whatever projects we're part of. Also, there's a kind of um, bigger project sense that I have for the group. So I I like to write things that are at least an hour often that are evening length pieces that are epic kinds of pieces. So more than just doing individual songs, we're not that kind of group. We're a group that dives really deep into an aesthetic and ethos and then works very hard and, um, and in a committed and subtle manner on, on more lengthy projects. Yeah. So we have a couple of things even all the way into 2022, I think. Wow. Yeah. That's that we're so going to cool. be just diving into and developing and working on. Um, yeah. And so to, we kind of want to go back in time a little bit to Tamar because we have mm. a couple of great, um, and one example that we would like to play is traveling, which I know is a little bit of a departure from what you're doing now, but certainly has um, fueled who you yeah. are. And so the the excerpt that we have is is traveling, yeah. and we're going to try to play that. Can you tell us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. I mean, yeah, and connecting it to Constellation. Like I said, I work with, I like to develop long term relationships with people. So Tamron Goldberg and Jen and I, uh, um are you'll hear them they're singing in this traveling music and they're also currently in constellation core and that's where we met was doing tomorrow of the river so and this is actually already the the main seed of what i was interested in which is vocal textures and voices and what the voice can experiment with and do in groups is already the main thing that's happening in Tamar of the River. Tamar of the River is about this woman, Tamar, this young woman who is um, going on a journey to bring peace between the warring lands of East and West, and she has believes she's a prophet, that she's been called to do so oh. by the river. And then the river is sung and danced by 11, 12 people. Oh. And so... Ev- so um, everyone you'll hear in this is the river singing to Tamar. In traveling music, it's when she has just finally decided she has to leave her home and venture out to the West. And um, this, so in this piece, the river is being kind of guiding her where to travel. And she goes up a mountain, and that's where you'll hear Jambo. And then there's moments where she come, arrives at a clearing in the forest and 
Um, you'll hear that, I think, reflected in the music. And then finally, she's looking for the source of the river, for the river's source, to hear what it has to tell her. And that's where, what you'll hear at the end. And just one more thing, there's amazing pictures you can find on my website, and I just want to shout out to Chase Brock, who's an incredible choreographer and choreographed this, this piece. Great. Okay. Well, this is traveling music um, written by Marissa, Marissa Michelson from Tamar of the River. Jump in, I'll die. Blow, blow, I'll find some other way up. No other way up. You'll keep me safe. It begins at the source. May you always sing to me. Show me away, show me away. 
Suddenly it's all unclear. I don't know what I should say. I don't know what I should ask you. Will I disappear? Well, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> In that was, we were just chatting about how beautiful that is. I mean, it definitely has a musical quality. And again, that's traveling music from Tomorrow on the River by composer Marissa Michelson, who's in the studio. Welcome yeah, back. Thank you. Yeah, Tomorrow of the River. And that was Margot Seibert, you heard. Yeah. Um, a friend and student of mine. And um, she played Adrian and Rocky on Broadway. She's an incredible actress, singer. Oh, yeah. Um, it does have a... a a musical quality. Would you say that that one is your work that's the most like a musical? No, actually, the one that was produced after that, kind of recently, One Thousand Nights in One Day, I would say oh. is even most like a musical. Um, although in just different ways. Tomorrow of the River has a more traditional narrative and less traditional music, and One Thousand Nights has a kind of uh, excitingly chaotic narrative jumping back and forth in time oh. and the music that I wrote for that piece which was uh, written by Jason Grote is also uh, calls upon a bunch of different genres but are very securely situated in musical theater writing like here's a song here's a song I see I, there was also a lot of electronic music in that one we're going to record that one there will be a cast album as oh, well cool. at some point but no this one was um I just feel like I was taking all my forces and interests, which were off in a lot of experimental voice and new music and channeling it very clearly into writing a musical mm. into this form. Mm, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, we when I have the show, I talk a lot about about people's process and about mm -hmm. their writing process. And mm -hmm. I, I've had a chance to speak with you a bit about this fascinating uh, pr part of your process, which is so body oriented mm. in your composition, this, mm -hmm. this writing from the body, writing yeah. in the body. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Yes. Yes. Um, for a number of reasons, I felt I needed to move away from sitting either at the piano or at the computer uh, in order to create music. Partly my body actually revolted and I couldn't do it. I was too, I had too much physical pain. Um, I needed to be moving. And also I felt that I was I felt somehow I was cutting myself off from the life force that I wanted most deeply when I was staying still for so long ah. um, in one place inside. Yeah. So I wanted to take my writing outside and I wanted to take it into my body and I wanted to make sure I was bringing my wholeness and my body with me wherever I went a as a writer. That's And amazing. that's what brought me into voice. Yeah. And I use a process... Um, that involves kind of mindfulness meditation often, mm -hmm. um, allowing a, an external something outside of myself, whether it's, let's say, um, a color or a plant, or let's say it's, it's uh, you could also consider an idea something external, something that sparks my imagination is something external, um, uh, a smell, a, a touch, allowing the external to act on my internal state through um, hmm. mindfulness and then allowing, inviting a kind of impression into my whole body, spirit, mind, psyche, and allowing that impression to build in intensity and energy until it comes out of me as voice wow. or movement. Yeah. And then that is, that is, and then play and then continue playing in that arena so that I am feeling like I'm in touch with the essence of the thing I'm exploring with my own body and voice. And then after doing that, I will take a step back and reflect whether in th with words or with images um, or with thinking and see what it was that was coming alive in my voice and body. And once that's present, then I can go and do the, the hard work that I still have to do of sitting at the computer and yeah. putting it all into the different stabs and, you know, making sure that um, that everything is going to yeah. work together and. It yeah. sounds so integrated. I mean, it sounds so organic and so integrated and so, so pure, you know? That's well, it's like an attempt to get back to a kind of purity that was actually an intention I made for myself in going to McDowell. I was very uh -huh. clear. I even had a birthday party and invited all these people. So they, they remember they were in my room when I said, my goal right now is to get back to a kind of bravery and purity that I felt as a child. Um, and you had a birthday party sort of, 
celebrating that desire for the year or that intention. Yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> and do you have those people kind of hold you accountable? Was that sort well, of... No, I didn't. I just, it was to me, it just manif- it kind of expressed it very clearly out into the space. I love What that. I wanted to do. And it was actually a first action of being brave to, to share in front of a lot of people. Like, I don't feel I'm as brave as I want to be. I, I want to be braver. That. Um, and so, yeah, and I, and pure is another word. Yeah. And I don't think I, I have so far to go. And it's more that the process is one that I'm continually just attempting to enter into. Um, I'm, I don't do it perfectly. I make mistakes all the time, but it's like a kind of signpost for me, mm. a goal, a way, like it's an anchor, something yeah. that I can, can know, like a process I can love and aspire to yeah. and, and play with. That's beautiful. I have two more questions. One is, do you have any advice mm. for, for people who might want to be exploring this intentionality or, mm. or exploring perhaps some things that, I mean, you mm. know, you, it seems like you went at it pretty instinctively or directly, mm. maybe. Um, what advice do you have for, for anyone who might want to do some of this work? Like composing work or like intention work in I whatever it, field? I think in any field, mm. I mean, or whatever you'd like to offer. Sure. I mean, I sometimes I feel like I'm, I can't give advice ever because I just don't, I feel like everything is so individual and we're all coming from such different backgrounds. Right. But I, I feel like um, if it's possible to really combine discipline with, um, <laughs> with seeking, like, like use your ability to be disciplined, to discipline yourself towards, um, towards finding ways to explore spaces that are not so held in the current world we live in. So it's not necessarily like everyone's like, oh, yeah, this is my three hours to just turn off all of the internet and phone and just, you know, try to commune with the spirit for my art. Like that's not necessarily something everyone is talking about. It's not common. So uh, I would say if that's of interest to you in some small way, then just discipline yourself to do it. I just love discipline seeking. I feel mm. like that could be something I could paint on my wall. Discipline you know, seeking, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, my last question is some uh, some of our listeners' favorite question, yeah. and that is, what's turning you on this week? And so this can mm-hmm. be anything. It can be. It it doesn't have to be related to your work. It can be, and we've had everything from people saying like a Bravo TV show yeah. to a podcast to a book sure. to a magazine to an article to a writer to 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 whatever yeah so I ask you Marissa Michelson what's turning you on this yeah week? I mean the first when you say that the first thing for some reason I'm just gonna go with my first impulse because yeah. that's improvisation yeah um is radio labs podcast is oh, cool. just freaking killing it lately <laughs> and particularly their their three-part series of no the No series, N-O. Okay. Um, which I think is apropos for our time right now um, with the all the Me Too movement. Yeah, and yeah. I think that they dive into it with so much smartness and sensitivity and wideness of perspective. Everyone's voice needs to be heard. Men, women, people of all genders. Like, we're not at war. We're trying to to find a way to be together. And that that series made me like consider things and cry and also feel hope and learn stuff. And I would recommend it very highly. Fantastic. So that's Radio Lab. Radio Lab. And it's the No series yeah, in particular. Like Everything N-O. they do is great. I know, but... it is. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much all the time we have for today. So I'd like to thank my guest again, Marissa Michelson. We are so excited to be performing your work. I can't wait. And this is such a pleasure. And I love podcasts. Yay. So super fun. <laughs> well, and, and the podcast, of course, is widely available. And if you're interested in hearing more about the production of Namazark here in Cedar City, uh, you definitely can check out our website, which is uh, seu.edu slash apex, 
or the College of uh, Performing and Visual Arts. So suu.edu slash PVA or suu.edu slash music, whatever one you can remember or think of. Um, but those performances will be in January. And if you're interested in Marissa's music and want to know more about what she's doing, uh, she has a website, marissamichelson.com. And then the group that she is the founder of, uh, constellationcore.com also. So thanks so much. Marissa Thank for being you. here. All right. Well, we'll sign off for this week and we will see everybody again soon. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.